Without further ado, I bring you our speaker, Jack Schmidt. Thanks. Um, keep eating, drink coffee. Um, to a few friends in the audience who uh, are familiar with some of what I'm going to say, my apologies to you. Um, I have, I have, uh, I did have a chance to speak to the Colorado Water Congress and the Upper Colorado River Basin Commission um, this this summer about some of this work. So, um, I'm going to perhaps say things that uh, maybe are what some people in the audience want to hear. Um, um, and then I'm going to try to conclude with maybe some things that maybe make you think or maybe that you don't want to hear. So um, that's my style. Um, just so everybody's clear, I am just a college professor. Uh, nothing that I say really matters. Um, uh, I will tell you that for three and a half years, um, I did leave. Uh, my position at Utah State University and went down to Flagstaff and ran the Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center for the USGS. Uh, the center is the primary science provider for the adaptive management program there. And, and I've spent my life working on the Colorado River, uh, first starting to work there where I did my dissertation in Grand Canyon on how sandbars form uh, back in the mid 1980s. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, fully described in a long technical report um, which can be downloaded at uh, the Center for Colorado River Studies at Utah State University. If you Google that, you'll find on the homepage the link to download the technical report. All right. I also apologize. I have graphs and charts and numbers and all sorts of things, and uh, I'll try to make this interesting. Okay, um, don't shoot me, it wasn't my idea, um, but I've known about this idea for a long time. Um, the Glen Canyon Institute, a small organization in Salt Lake, has worked uh, over the years to propose a permanent draining of Lake Powell and um, uh, and that idea uh, has lots of popularity, and it gained uh, lots of notice with uh, commis former Commissioner Beard's book, uh, which asserted that, Lake, that Glen Canyon Dam should be decommissioned and Lake Powell drained. Um, it got lots of publicity in a series of articles by ProPublica appeared in the New York Times. Whether you think the idea is crazy or not, and let's just assume most people here think it's crazy, um, it's an idea that won't go away. And it's an idea that no matter how much you may think you understand the details, the idea won't go away. So it's worth thinking about. Um, the proposal that has emerged then, yeah, um, is to progressively drain Lake Powell and progressively bias the system to fill water in Lake Mead by a series of phases, the first of which is to essentially have your objective be to maintain Lake Powell at minimum power pool, store the rest of the water in Lake Mead, then preferentially move to uh, may, trying to maintain Lake Powell at dead pool, keep all the rest of the water at Lake Mead, and then in some imaginary time, let her rip and not have a Lake Powell. Um, with a set of objectives, not the least of which is the savings of water. Now, in the, you know, just to try to preserve an audience for a few minutes, 
Um, I'm going to submit that rather than just say, well, that's a crazy idea and, and, and start taking phone calls outside, another way to think about this is what I'm going to talk about might be an idea that is intentionally done, such as what Glen Canyon Institute might, um, might want, but by the same token, it might also be a situation of a hand being forced on us by climate change. And so another way to think about it is the things I'm going to talk about might be what are the implications downstream if our hand is forced and Lake Powell does get much lower. And so you can think about this from that perspective um, and maybe we'll learn something about it. Now, I just grabbed some quotes out of the New York Times article, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but what I want to uh, make clear here and what's the basis on what I'm trying to talk about, I wonder if I know what to push here. Watch it here. Oh, yeah, there we go. Is I circled in here all the references to water that would be saved by the proposal. Now, obviously, anybody who is in the business of um, writing publicity and information uh, in this water business knows that if you really want to scare people and get people's attention, you put in the article numbers like billions of gallons of water, which, of course, is a big number, except it's a completely meaningless number to anybody who is in the business, like what, what, I don't know what a billion gallons of water is either. So um, I just converted all the numbers to millions of acre feet, and um, the references are to savings of water of half a million acre feet a year. Um, that's a big number. Uh, for those of you who don't live and breathe these numbers, I suspect most people do, but let's use uh, a unit that I've tried to offer, which is one Nevada. The unit of measurement is a Nevada. And a Nevada is 300,000 uh, 300, acre feet per year, which is the smallest entitlement of any of the states in, under the Colorado River Compact. So these are numbers that are bigger than one Nevada. So maybe, maybe there's something to this. Uh, as we all know, a basic water balance, change in reservoir storage, is equal to how much water flows in, how much it rains on the reservoir, how much you lose in evaporation, whether you've got groundwater going in or out of the reservoir, minus how much you release downstream. I've got an arrow for each of these up here. And the truth of the matter is, how much water goes out? Well, we know that precisely. We do precisely measure the inflows to Powell. Up here at Cisco, up here at Green River, down here at Mexican Hat. There's a lot of ground downstream from those, res from those gauges that is unmeasured inflow to Powell. That introduces uncertainty to the water balance because we have to parameterize the rest of the inflows to Pell. We don't understand evaporation well. It rains about half a foot a year on Lake Pell. The other big question is what happens to groundwater seepage, right? Does that make sense? You know, the ins and outs. So the assertion of Glen Canyon Institute and a paper published in the Journal of the American Water Resources Association, um, JAWA, um, is that um, the present losses associated with storage of water in Lake Powell, what would the losses be? The two big ones are evaporation off of the reservoir surface, water seeping into the Navajo sandstone, right? Those are the big things that we lose. And so that's a loss is E for evaporation, G for groundwater losses, and estimated for PAL half a million acre feet a year lost in evaporation, and 270,000 acre feet a year lost into the surrounding groundwater system. Those are big numbers. That's not to be trivialized. 
Um, the estimate for Lake Mead is 800,000 acre feet. It's hotter down there, isn't it? Uh, but not much seepage. The total losses associated with storing water in the southern end of the Colorado Plateau is the sum of those two losses. Basically, the argument is made that even though you would preferentially store water in Mead where it's hotter and the evaporation rates would go up, you would eliminate this seepage loss into the Navajo sandstone and the net would be savings of water because you save a lot more water by, by not having groundwater seepage and that would make up for the, slight, the somewhat bigger evaporation off of meat. Does that make sense? That's the argument. So let's look at this. Um, when I would talk to lots of people involved in the water management business, they say, well, it's absurd to store water in Lake Mead. It's so much hotter down there. The evaporation is so much more. Um, in fact, this is an old map of, anticipate, uh, uh, of um, evaporation pan data throughout the United States. And uh, using these old maps from the 50s and 60s, there's a substantial difference in the evaporation rate which is how much water per year, I'm 6'2". So you can think that this is a little bit more than one Schmidt, and this is about two-thirds of one Schmidt. That's another unit that we can have. All right. Well, water matters a lot in Lake Mead. And because of that, there's been lots of science and lots of studies at Lake Mead. Here are a range of studies, including the most re a recent study estimating that evaporation is 7.5 feet per year, using a number of different standard methods that any civil engineer in this room was taught in their basic physical hydrology class. It's beyond uh, this talk for me to go through each of these methods and why they came up with the numbers that they did. You can read the technical uh, report. And these lines show the monthly evaporation rate for each of those studies. The science of measuring evaporation has evolved and the state of the science measurement is the eddy covariance technique that's now used to directly measure the flux of water vapor off the surface of water bodies. And because things really matter down there, Reclamation began to fund the USGS to measure directly the flux of water vapor off of Lake Mead. Uh, and these studies um, <clears throat> have been reported. And so these are actual measurements of the evaporation rate in the most recent five years of published data. So these are real measurements, okay? You can see that the total evaporation in any year actually is different from year to year. You can see that the month of the greatest evaporation is different from year to year. If August is cloudy, the evaporation rate is not as great. And so one simple number averages a lot of uncertainty. But what's the total amount of water evaporated off of Lake Mead? Well, you've got to measure the black numbers, the evaporation rate, one Schmidt, plus or minus, uh, for a year times the surface area of Lake Mead. The surface area of Lake Mead goes up and down depending on how much water you store there. And so these black numbers are the numbers published by the USGS. So I went to the records of uh, storage changes at Lake Mead and determined the, red, the uh, red line and then I multiplied the red line by the black line to get these values, which is the total evaporated water at Lake Mead during these five years. You can see that the average rates 
of evaporation per year or sort of plus or minus one Schmidt, um, they're not 7.5 feet per year. Um, they're a little bit lower than, uh, well, they, they vary. And the total amount of water evaporated off of Lake Mead in those five years varied from 500 to 590,000 acre feet a year. So that's the real deal and that program continues to be, um, uh, be underway. Now I'm going to represent those real state of the science measurements by this curve, which is the average evaporation rate in each month reported by the USGS in their most recent data. And these error bars are the range of monthly evaporation in those five years. So you can see that the process, even when you measure it carefully, is in fact a highly variable process from year to year, depending on the weather, depending on the temperature of the surface of Lake Mead, right? Okay. Um, the, most, the last time that evaporation was measured on Lake Powell was in the mid-1970s. Nothing else. Lake Mead, Lake Powell wasn't anywhere close to being full yet. The numbers that we use come from that study by the Caltech group. Nothing else. So, these are those average values. That's the range of, un that's the variability of what was measured. Some of you might sit there and go, huh, we got this state-of-the-art science program at Lake Mead. We're measuring it all the time. We measure it right now. We're using numbers that we haven't updated on the process since the mid-1970s. Be that as it may, well then some of you might say, so hold it, I know that the number for evaporation at Lake Powell is four feet per year because that's the number that's used in the CRSS model that reclamation uses to model the system. And you're saying four feet per year at Powell, six plus feet at Mead, you'd be crazy to store water in Mead. But anybody who knows the internal guts of the CRSS system knows that the evaporation rate reported for Powell is not the actual evaporation. It is the evaporation rate that was measured by Caltech with what I've labeled pre-dam ET sep uh, um, here removed from that number. Because for purposes of implementing the compact, the upper basin did not want to be charged for the amount of water that was evaporated or evapotranspired from the riparian forest of the area of Lake Powell. And they said, we only should be charged with what's new and additional off of PAL. Now that makes perfect sense for the administrative and legal side of the discussion. But it isn't the number that one can use if one is going to objectively compare how much water is evaporated from PAL and how much water is evaporated from Mead. So it turns out that the number that's in everybody's head is a much lower number than what is real, and it's an old number that hasn't been updated in 40 years. And it turns out that the state of the science numbers for Mead are in fact lower than what the early studies showed. So it turns out that the numbers for the evaporation rates in the two reservoirs aren't nearly as different as has been inside all of us all along. There's the comparison. Now I will admit that the blue numbers are old, outdated, 40 year old, not state of the science numbers, and the red numbers are state of the science numbers. That's apples and oranges. But these are the best numbers that the federal government gives us to work with. 
This is the best scientific understanding. And so the image to say is the best numbers we have is that there's not much evaporation difference at PAL and MEAT. There you go. The evaporation rate has to be multiplied by the surface area of the reservoirs. I went to the back of the, uh, one of the appendices of the interim shortage guideline EIS, took the relationship between water storage and surface area and plotted them on the same plot. This data has been sitting around for a long time when I walked into my friends at Reclamation Salt Lake said, did you know that the surface area of Lake Powell is more than the surface area of Lake Mead? for most volume stored there, everybody said, wow, wow. <clears throat> Nobody, I mean, this is just, you know, I just, this is just a guy back to the university who's been the big shot in the Grand Canyon. Now he's just being a prof and I'm just having a midlife crisis and so I'm trying to be relevant. So I'm working on all these things, you know, you know, sit in my office because I've left GCMRC and so these are the things I'm doing. But I know where all the data are because I've worked inside the federal government for several years before this. So there you go. The surface, so this, this is a, one story. The evaporation rates at PAL, we think, are only a little bit less than the evaporation rates at Mead. The surface area of PAL is more than the surface area of Mead for the same storage. Multiply a little bit smaller by a little bit bigger number, vice versa, guess what? It really doesn't make much difference. <clears throat> I assumed a simple equalization strategy where I said if, if Lake Powell and Lake Mead are 30% full and you store the water equally in Powell and Mead, I you know, multiplied surface areas by evaporation rates. Those are the evaporation rates with uncertainty for Powell and Mead. Uh, under different scenarios, having them 30% full, 40, 50% full. The answer is it's not much different between the two reservoirs. It doesn't really make a difference where you store the water. And the number is if you add these up, it's, you know, 1.1 million acre feet a year we're losing to evaporation off the two reservoirs. That's more than three Nevadas. Non trivial number. And if you preferentially stored water in Mead and you preferentially kept Powell empty, recognizing a range of possible total storage contents, the total number is not really any different. So in that regard, in that regard, Glen Canyon Institute was wrong. They assumed that evaporation, if you preferentially stored water in Mead, would be much more than in Lake Powell. And they'd have to, you know, there'd have to be some other savings. Turns out, it doesn't really matter where you store the water. <clears throat> um, but there's an awful lot of uncertainty. And um, I will say, I mean, I, I, I'm, what I've done is trusted by reclamation. It's all been reviewed. I've given this talk at the Adaptive Management Program, other places, and I am. I'm um, happy and a little bit pr proud to say that Reclamation has now issued a contract to begin new studies of evaporation at Lake Pell. And um, there you go. It is possible for a guy sitting in a room in North Logan, Utah, to come up with some analysis that inspires the government to get the right numbers. And nobody hesitated to get the right numbers. <clears throat> Okay, we got this water disappearing into the Navajo sandstone, the great sponge of the Navajo sandstone. Well, <clears throat> this figure is from the Caltech report, which anticipated a substantial loss of groundwater into the Navajo sandstone when Lake Powell was created. And it shows um, the best estimate of what the groundwater potentiometric surface looked like before Lake Powell was created. Water moving from the high country to the old Colorado River, giving rise to the wonderful seeps and springs in that canyon that were described as glens. 
by John Wesley Powell. Then the name of the canyon. Uh, filling Lake Powell inevitably had to create a movement of groundwater from the reservoir into the surrounding groundwater system. It can't not by all the basic principles of geophysics that most of you in this room are familiar with. And that movement of water would have to go on until a new stable, assuming the reservoir didn't change elevation, a new wedge of water created a lower gradient potentiometric surface in which water then is still moving from the high country to that higher level of Lake Powell. Does that make sense? In the mid-1980s, the Geological Survey actually used all the available um, res uh, well data, springs, what have you, to map their estimated potentiometric field of water flow uh, at that time in the mid-80s. And you can see all the arrows, as sketchy as they are, are all going towards Lake Powell. Now, I'm showing this to show you that, and, and now, Here's another insight. This is uh, 90, 35 years ago, these studies were done. And yet when Glen Canyon Institute would talk about how the water is gonna disappear forever into the Navajo sandstone, never to be seen again, nobody ever made reference to these studies. It's, it's, I could give you another talk, which is the sociology of what I did, which is just a guy who read every report that everybody else had forgotten about and a guy who had the time and was willing to do it for whatever personal failings reasons that I have to, that I did it. But whatever the case, anybody else could have read this stuff and we could have resolved this long ago, but nobody had. <clears throat> it turns out that the survey modeled the ground, the potentiometric surface in the vicinity of Lake Powell, um, and let's just focus on the blue lines, which are the flow lines, 1985 report showing groundwater moving towards the Colorado River. They model the groundwater flow conditions around Lake, uh, around Glen Canyon Dam after the reservoir would be full. Whoa. And here it is. And oh, look at that. Groundwater going around the dam through the Navajo sandstone and back leaving the reservoir by groundwater flow, and then coming back into the river. That's irreversible loss seepage. But if you're an insider to the game, you've known about this for a long time, and the Upper Colorado Basin Commission paid the USGS in Arizona to measure what that loss was. And these are some gauging measurements. We don't need to go into that. Uh, between 1989 and 1993, they operated a gauge immediately below the dam and the, the uh, gauge at Lee's Ferry and found that the seepage rate was unmeasurable. No change in the total annual flow. But ironically, uh, between 2000 and 2004, they measured a 400,000 acre foot difference um, in uh, the flow immediately below the dam and at least ferry. So there is water that seeps around, but the nice thing is for compact compliance purposes, it's the flow at Lee's ferry that is considered for compact compliance, not the release from the dam. So that water that seeps around the dam is still measured as a delivery from the upper basin to the lower basin. Um, uh, this one's a little dangerous. Um, this is, there were many studies that have, that have estimated the rates of groundwater, of, of movement of reservoir water into the surrounding Navajo sandstone. This is, the length of these bars is a period of time of the study and the estimate of the rate for that amount of time. These studies, Jacoby was um, Caltech funded by the Bureau of Reclamation, 
Thomas, funded by Bureau of Reclamation, USGS. Um, the point here is the rates were very high when Powell first full, filled. There are memos that Reclamation stated, we're worried about how big this number is. But in fact, the rates declined with time. The red number by Myers is sort of the number of the study that sort of supports the Glen Canyon Institute's assertion of high loss rates. And the point is, the modeling studies done by the USGS in the future all projected an order of magnitude decrease as the path length of the water through the Navajo sandstone gets further and further away, inevitably the loss rate of the water out into the surrounding country gets much, much less. And the estimates that there would be this massive savings of water associated with uh, continued large seepage, which is the science that underpins the, uh, the proponents of the idea, is based on assuming that the high rate of the past continues indefinitely into the future. There's no basis for that. And therefore, if you take the numbers and extrapolate them as best that they exist, um, this is my take on um, using the numbers of the USGS studies in the mid-80s for what would be the loss rate if PAL were full all the time. And it's numbers like 50,000 acre-feet a year, not 500,000 acre-feet a year. There is a loss in continuing to fill up the Navajo sandstone, but it's probably 10% of what is asserted in these um, other contentions. So, evaporation's a, a, a wash. A uh, little bit of savings on uh, seepage. Um, Lake Mead has lots of saturated ground around it, all the alluvium. Uh, in all the valleys around Lake Mead, this stuff is monitored by the USGS, but there are no comparable studies around Lake Mead to the kind of studies that were done in the 70s around Lake Pell. All right, let me pick up the pace here. Now let's shift gears, that's losses. What happens to the restoration of Lake Powell? In dark blue, in a red is what Lake Powell looks like at minimum power pool. In blue is what Lake Powell looks like at dead pool. You can see that although the reservoir gets much smaller, it's still a long snaky body of standing water. There, will, there is a waterfall at the entrance of the, the uh, San Juan River to Pal. There would be a waterfall because the river goes over a bedrock ledge downstream from height. Um, that's going to affect the communication of native and non-native fishes between Lake Powell Reservoir and the upper basin that would have to be dealt with. What happens when the reservoir gets empty? This is a photograph um, at reasonably full pool. At height, there's the old height marina. Here's that river in 2004 near its lower stage. And then later in the year, um, with a well-developed tamarisk forest on that accumulated reservoir sediment. Um, Look at that yellow arrow, which is a fixed elevation, as Lake Powell is lower in 2003. Uh, we have the blooming of the tamarisk in 2004. This is the river incising and sawing its way through that sediment as Lake Powell gets lower. John Dornwen unfortunately prematurely died. He was taking these pictures. He estimated that 75% of the total volume of sediment eroded was associated with incising the channel. You're, that you're mobilizing some sediment. Um, 
but at the same time, there's some evacuation on the sides, but you're gonna leave those big deltaic sediments on the sides of an incising river as Lake Powell gets lower. With those pictures in mind, this is a highly exaggerated longitudinal profile of the Colorado River from the dam, that's 50 kilometers, 100 kilometers upstream from the dam, and in black is the old bed of the river that was floated by John Wesley Powell coming downstream, and then this is the profile for the San Juan River. Each color is the survey of the bed of the reservoir now, and the difference between the colors and black is the accumulated sediment of the deltas of the Colorado River. So if we apply those processes, there's the delta of Lake Powell. We lower the reservoir to minimum power pool, and the river is gonna saw through these deltas, and then, but it's still a big long reservoir, which is still more nearly 200 kilometers long, and so you're just gonna move and recreate new deltas lower down. You lower the reservoir to dead pool, on it goes. The important point is, you're gonna still store the water in Lake Powell, and the releases of water into, Glen Can into Grand Canyon will still be crystal clear. You're not gonna deliver that sediment down into the Grand Canyon because you're just remobilizing the sediment. It's still gonna settle in the new very long reservoir. Will a lower Lake Powell allow us to run the river at a run of the river way? No, because the releases from the dam are controlled by the engineering infrastructure. And the engineering infrastructure allows 31,500 cubic feet per second to be released through the power plant turbines. If the water goes below minimum power pool at Glen, you can't do that. You can only then use the by the the uh, bypass tubes, whose maximum capacity is 15,000 cubic feet per second. And so we modeled that. This is a typical year in blue of the hydrograph of the water, the natural inflow to Lake Powell. And if you're below minimum power pool, in red is the best that you could release downstream from Glen into the Grand Canyon. That's a fun, there's no electricity produced, and that red hydrograph looks nothing like the natural run of the river. You're limited by the engineering capacity of the structures. And um, this would be the elevations of Lake Powell. You might start below minimum power pool, but if you can't release an incoming flood of 100,000 CFS downstream, Lake Powell is just gonna become a wildly fluctuating body of water because you can't get rid of the stuff. Last point, what's the temperature of the water released in the Grand Canyon? Everyone here knows that water temperature is probably, is, you know, it and flow regime are the most significant ecosystem drivers, the most significant determinants of ecosystem condition. We have fixed elevations that we take water out, and because the water is released at depth when Lake Powell is full, none of this warm water is released into Grand Canyon, and that's when you're rigging your boat at Lee's Ferry, your ankles tingle because the water is so damn cold. Um, this is some ongoing work just coming out of GCMRC and I'm working with them on this. And these are model temperatures throughout the upper Colorado River Basin in July. My only point here is these dark blues are cooler numbers than the normal conditions upstream. Glen Canyon Dam and releases at, at high pool create an artificially cold and unusually cold Grand Canyon. And in, the, in, in December, it's unusually warm. 
We've created a novel ecosystem adjusted to this. It's beyond my remarks here to talk about the pluses and minuses, but the general consensus is the artificially cold temperatures in Grand Canyon actually allow the endangered species of humpback chub to actually hang in there. And um, um, because it keeps the non-native invasives from Lake Mead from coming up through the system. Now that's up for debate, but the point is if, well, so this is time, back to the creation of Glen Canyon Dam. This is Lake Powell filling. That's the record of the surface elevation of Lake Powell. And this is a temperature regime of the Colorado River released downstream into Grand Canyon. Hot in the summer, cold in the winter, boom, 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 boom. Reservoir starts to fill, the oscillations decrease till the reservoir gets above minimum power pool and the temperatures begin to get to be about a constant 47 degrees Fahrenheit and it's cold and it stays that way. And it only starts to oscillate again here with the declining Lake Powell. Is this good or bad? I can't talk, I mean that's a different conversation. But the point is we've created a novel ecosystem addicted to the cold temperature releases of Glen Canyon Dam. And if we change all that and we make it warm again, all bets are off of what's gonna happen. So these are my conclusions. I've gone through the evaporation and seepage issues on Lake Powell. You're gonna save a little bit of water, but we don't know a hell of a lot. We're starting to get better numbers in evaporation. It's wonderful if uh, reclamation is gonna do that. Seabage, we're doing no studies. I would submit we need to. Uh, it's certainly not a panacea of wondering, wonderfully reestablishing a natural flow regime in Grand Canyon in terms of flow regime or temperature. Okay, so Jim, I'm just, this is, no, 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 I got a couple more because I want to get people to really dislike me. <laughs> All right, so we can look at this and say, I, I, four minutes. We can say, oh, we know, there's this little environmental group and how naive they were. And isn't this silly that they would come up with such a naive idea? And um, we can do that. And of course, they all make salaries that are a quarter of what most of us make. And they're just trying to create a discussion. And they have come up with an And we can also criticize reporters who have sort of written glossy articles about how wonderful that idea is to get Glen Canyon back without really anybody looking at the numbers. We could do that. But maybe what the Glen Canyon Institute also did was they caused us to actually think about how it all works on the Southern Colorado Plateau. <clears throat> it's um, about 500 river miles from the confluence of the Grand and the Green Rivers in Canyonlands National Park down to the Grand Wash Cliffs. About 50% of that length of river is now converted to the two largest reservoirs in the United States. The other part is this scenic ditch managed by the National Park Service. And in many, in many talks today, we've talked about Lake Powell. We've even, I've heard people say, that's why we need to keep Lake Powell full. And here, of course, in the middle of this place is this magic line that separates the upper basin from the lower basin. Well, because of the challenges that water deliveries from this side to that side of the red line needed a lot of negotiation. As Eric Kuhn explained to us, we've had to do just what Eric observed, which is the compact will be whatever the comp we want the compact to be. And one of those efforts was the negotiation of the interim shortage guidelines adopted in 2007, which ever so subtly changed the administrative rules of how water is exchanged from the upper basin to the lower basin. 
So we're kind of changing it. Now, every ecosystem study that I know of in Grand Canyon shows that ecosystem conditions, sediment conditions, sandbar conditions, every damn thing, temperature conditions, are greatly affected by the volume of water released out of Glen Canyon Dam through. It, it affects sediment deficit, it affects how fast the river warms, it affects riparian vegetation, it affects a gazillion things. And the releases of water out of PAL downstream are controlled by the interim shortage guidelines, which didn't care a hoot about the environmental implications of those rules. And what we've got as a condition now is when we need to equalize the reservoir, we'll just release a big slug because that'll make things better. You know, that'll equalize the storage availability, regardless of whether the sediment and environmental conditions in Grand Canyon can handle it. That's not right. We ought to think about the Southern Colorado Plateau differently. All the water comes in up here. You guys are focused on the balance between in-stream needs and external and, and consumptive uses. But the reality is relatively little, all this water goes through this scenic bottleneck. And then people start using it down here. And within this distance, there just isn't much water consumed coming in or going out. It's a number like 700,000 acre feet a year that sort of comes in. We can deal with that. And we should never forget that just talking about water supply in the reservoirs isn't the only value in this watershed. There are people who will fall on their swords for their perception of the environmental side of this issue. And so I would assert that as we move forward, we're thinking about this wrong-headed to have this focus of saying, and that way we'll get more water to Lake Powell and that'll be better. That's blind thinking confined to the box of the existing compact. I would submit that what we ought to be saying is, and if we save more water upstream, we can deliver more water to the, to the Powell Grand Canyon Mead system. And when it's down there, we want to do the best to meet the combined objectives of water supply reliability and environmental rehabilitation. And when we renegotiate the interim shortage guidelines, river concerns need to be at the table. So we say, what is the best way to store water that also does the best for the most valued, iconic landscape of this planet. And I, I'm a scientist. I, I live and die by the numbers. And I will say, most all the numbers right now say, makes more sense to store it in PAL because it maintains this novel ecosystem. But in the brave new world, if PAL inevitably is gonna go dry, we might have to face the, where is it best to store water? And when we get to there, we need to think about the environmental side. That's my story, I'm sticking to it. Lake Powell, the Phil Mead first idea has problems now but there's lots of uncertainty. We need to dive into the uncertainty. You'd never want to implement this plan now. The environmental issues are substantial, but the one good thing about all of this is it causes us to scratch our heads and say, maybe we need to think about where, just how we think about water storage and environmental protection in the Southern Colorado Plateau. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We, we can take a question or two. Could you let me just leave? <laughs> no way. Go ahead and we'll repeat it. 
So the question is, uh, there's plans for a pipeline from Lake Powell to St. George in southwestern Utah. And what does that bring to this subject? Well, it's like everything else in this business. There's no easy answer. So as a sediment, as I'm really, really, I'm just a geomorphologist. Um, Grand Canyon's problem is not too little water. It's too much water relative to the fact that it has no sediment. So in that sense, it doesn't matter, hill of beans, if you decrease the amount of flow through, you're not going to probably significantly affect the river resources. This, it's a sediment imbalance that matters much more. Um, somebody at the Colorado Water Congress was asked a question about this or some other conference I was at recently and said, well, that amount of water in that pipeline is small potatoes compared to the big issues of climate change and decrease in, and runoff and things like that. So, but by the same token, you could say, does it make any sense to put any new straw in anywhere in this river? And I would submit it makes no sense to, to put a new straw in anywhere. I suspect, I should be careful, I am an employee of the state of Utah. To, <laughs> but I'll just say anyway, because if they fire me, I'll quit. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, they probably want to build the infrastructure, and then if there's not enough water, they'll start buying ag water rights in the Uinta Basin, retire that to meet that urban demand. It's going to be an urban ag battle that they're not admitting to. Um, the Lake Powell in pipeline inputs um, are pretty low, so Powell could be quite low, and they'd still be able to take water. But I, as a general matter, makes no sense to put another straw in the river. One more question? Great. So that, okay, so the question was, um, uh, um, well, is seepage, when the reservoir gets low, does that groundwater return? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I did not. I'm looking at steady state conditions under full reservoirs to look at the relative merits of storing both. The, water, the seepage rates back in are a non-trivial and real thing in that smallest wedge. And on one figure, I subtly had said, well, there's a wedge of regular communication. And then there's this other zone where, in fact, if you permanently drained Lake Powell and just kept it empty, all of that water is going to come back. It's just going to come back over centuries. So it is a real phenomenon. The way reclamation has handled it in CRSS modeling is to assume that it all comes back instantaneously. That is not fair. And that is not honest. There is, in fact, an irreversible long-term loss if PAL stays full. But it's a relatively small number. One more question. Where? Okay. Why do you assume that Glen Canyon Dam will be removed? Why don't you assume that? Okay, so the third stage, uh, yeah, why don't you just look at a scenario where Glen Canyon Dam is removed? Um, is there a back door I can get out? <laughs> um, um, that is the next. That is the next step, and what I what I assert is that these phase one and phase two don't get you anything. And if you're going to go for it, there's no option other than going for the whole enchilada. Now, then we're not looking at. Uh, I, I I analyze existing proposals. If the brave new world is a world where the runoff regime is at the worst end of the probability distributions, there is in fact an alternative that is available. It is to redrill the river diversion tunnels and then with a big enough capacity 
and then you're passing a natural sediment load and a natural flow regime, and the biggest issue you're gonna to have to face then is all that, then Grand Canyon goes into being swamped with sediment, and Lake Mead again becomes the sole collector of sediment, which is a non-trivial issue to debate with Southern Nevada more than anybody else. But is that what we ought to do over the long term if the worst of the climate change projections comes? It's an utterly reasonable idea. I don't know how many billion dollars that is to redrill, reinforce concrete, ton, uh, you know, tunnels out, but it is possible. And it's an utterly rational thing to consider and evaluate. You're absolutely right. Great, thank you, Jack. Um, let's have another hand for our speaker. Thanks.